Carla is a high school Latin teacher who makes Latin learner-friendly Latin and ancient Greek content on YouTube. Uh, she hopes to make comprehensible input in the ancient languages more accessible for more learners. Uh, her videos consist mostly, I love the mostly, mostly of lighthearted stories or topics in spoken Latin or ancient Greek uh, with subtitles and visuals. She's published a Latin audiobook, Aneidos Liber Quartus, and is currently working on producing a tiered reader for Aeneid Book 4. So let's welcome uh, Carla. Thank you. Uh, I've got the structure of my course, uh, sorry, of my um, talk here. Is my writing mirrored or is it the right way around? It is the right way around. Okay, good, because it's mirrored on my view, but <laughs> at least I know that it's not mirrored for everyone else. So uh, I titled my talk, Magistri Apututu Boom, like teachers on YouTube. But really, I'm not so much going to be talking about this from the perspective of me being a content creator and being like rah rah content creation, more from the perspective of I'm a teacher and this is how much I really want more content to be out there. Uh, so I'll start by talking about the purpose of my talk and then my own personal teaching journey. How did I get to be into communicative language teaching in Latin? Then I'll talk about the challenges that I have faced and that other teachers I know have faced in switching from more grammar translation or reading method things to more communicative methods and how the content, especially YouTube video content, helps alleviate the burdens and pressures of that translation uh, transition. And uh, I'll finally end with a call to action about how we just really need more content to be created and what can we do to um, really help that process along because it is so beneficial to more people accessing Latin in a comprehensible, communicative way. Uh, so first of all, that purpose of the talk I kind of just said was um, I want us to think about how um, how content creation really changes uh, things outside of specifically YouTube, um, things like classrooms and how that works with teachers, how it really supports teachers. Um, and I speak from the perspective of mostly being an in-person teacher at the moment at school, high school, um, middle school and high school. And um, yet I have also had some forced experience doing online teaching with, during Melbourne's extremely long lockdowns. So uh, I know a little bit about online teaching and I may eventually return to that space at some point. And I hope that the lessons that I am learning in in-person teaching can be applied to online environments with some tweaks, with some caveats that this is not the same social environment. Uh, so first of all, how did I get to be where I am here? Um, I started teaching in 2017 in schools, although I had been tutoring since about 2012. And the tradition that I had been raised in was grammar translation mixed with the reading method. So starting off with tables and teaching rules and getting exercises done and then going into translating longer texts. Uh, in 2021, poof, I became a communicative language teacher because I tried learning Hebrew in multiple ways and eventually stumbled on Aleph with Beth's YouTube channel and the YouTube videos which were all comprehensible input, highly visual, highly spoken and they clicked in a way that other things really did not click. Uh, it was joyful, it was like not just a little bit better than uh, all the other stuff that I'd tried before but more like 10 times better kind of thing. So I was so convinced by actual experience learning language that way that I wanted it for my students. I went towards more doing things like holding up plastic animals and talking stories about them, like sharing stories about them. Uh, so that's how I got there. But um, in that process, YouTube videos were quite critical to me wanting to change, partly because they make communicative language teaching really discoverable for Latin teachers who can otherwise be quite isolated and insulated from modern language teaching methods um, because we, we can get a bit tribal 
in the Latin teaching world. And when you see real examples of it uh, and you see it done well, it makes you really want that for your students. You're like, oh, shiny, I want that. But immediately after that, there's a, a feeling of dread of I couldn't possibly do that. I'm not fluent enough or uh, I haven't been raised that way. How can I adapt? And the next question is like, what about my, my colleagues? Uh, they might be less keen on this than I am. And I'm already got, I've already got reservations on whether I can do this. So uh, video content, as I will explain, can really relieve a lot of the fears and the tensions with, uh, can we do this? Is it achievable? All right, so here's my graph of people who know Latin in the Latin classroom. Generally, the teacher knows a, a fair amount of the language, and especially in a novice classroom, the students don't really know a whole lot. And um, so who's going to be providing large amounts of comprehensible input if you're going to be going into spoken or uh, interactive modes, it's going to mostly fall on the teacher. I mean, if you ask two, especially two novice students to talk to the person next to you, here are some phrases you can use to sustain a conversation. They're going to use some of those phrases mechanically and then immediately switch back to their native language. Uh, like in my experience, that's what novices do. And uh, I've also done some research on this. Novice learners especially are reactive and um, they don't have the competency needed to sustain an interaction. They need the teacher, at least uh, at the beginning stages, to be supporting that with them. Uh, so everyone talk to your partner doesn't quite work in, an, in a uh, classroom setting. Uh, I bet that that correlation, like, sorry, the... Um, the thing that would match in an online setting would be something like everyone going to breakout rooms and talk to each other for a bit. Uh, what ends up happening in the classroom then is here I am as a teacher and I there's a whole lot of pressure on me to be constantly performing, to be drawing the attention of all 20 students in this novice classroom to me while I am talking with one fairly reluctant student who doesn't quite want to reply to me, but I'm drawing out their responses. Uh, so what I find is um, I have a lot of energy expenditure being that performer in the classroom, while these other students are just on the edge of about to have some kind of behavior problem. And so I have this kind of split focus where not only am I a performer, but I'm also a hawk looking out for behavior management problems and trying to intervene before they become big problems. Because um, unfortunately, that means that if I am intervening with these guys who are about to do something uh, that's going to be disruptive, I have to stop being a performer. I have to interrupt my own conversation that I'm having, this valuable conversation I'm having with this student. And, uh, and I interrupt it so that I can deal with that problem because otherwise it's going to become a much bigger problem. People are going to start throwing uh, paper or something at each other. Uh, in online settings, this is not quite how it rolls. Uh, you don't really get all this kind of disruptive interaction between students the same way as you have in person. But you do have this pressure to perform where everyone is having their eyes straight on you and it can be draining in its own way. Uh, so. Yeah, it's um, every time that you come up to the classroom, you have to perform at that same energy level, but your energy levels can drain quite a lot by the end of the week. And that makes it really tempting to go back to grammar translation methods, which were a little bit easier on the teacher. What really helps is if you have the ability to incorporate a other piece of media such as a YouTube video as a segment of a class. And um, what I find is actually in this chaotic conversation that you're having with the student, or not so much chaotic, but it's a conversation that's a little bit strained and constantly subject to interruptions in the classroom. That could have been like a five minute or two minute video, but because of the nature of the, the setting, 
acting, it gets drawn out to 20 minutes because you just, that's how many interruptions that you get from students in person. Whereas you could just show them a five minute video that is the distillation of that. And, uh, and they generally don't interrupt it. Um, you can spend more time in the target language with input rich media. Um, and you can, like sit at the edge, making sure that you're watching everyone's behavior and intervening quietly without interrupting this thing in people who need some kind of intervention. And um, the other thing I find about video format content is that the audio tends to be well recorded so that all the participants in whatever interactions happening on screen, all of them are audible. And you can have that speaker in your classroom project to every corner of the room. In the online setting, it would be something like um, there's no no one's going to have a microphone problem uh, that you're speaking to if you're showing a video that's being pre-recorded. Um, so it's more audible and it's more comprehensible in other ways, such as the way that videos can use visuals to support meaning and captioning, the um, target language captioning or subtitling. That can be really helpful for students who need a little bit more support in seeing what, what words, uh, what are the word boundaries and things like that. Um, so this tends to not be as interrupted as this, but it can also serve as a kind of model. Like if you are about to have a conversation with students that involve certain target structures and you first show them a video modeling all of that language use, you can then follow it up with a conversation, a live in-person, slightly more chaotic conversation with them and know that they have some idea already how this conversation could go and um, how it's being personalized to them. Uh, this really uh, helps me recharge because I'm no longer, I don't have that split focus between trying to be a performer at all times. I can have some breathing space, whether it be an online lesson or an in-person lesson, it allows me to not be constantly draining throughout the lesson. And um, all of that is really, really beneficial for being able to stay the course and to change to these kind of methods. Um, now, the next thing is that it's also a permanent record that students can access at later times. So if you have a video that contains some really important phrases or structures or vocabulary that you want to have in your course, then students can revisit it as revision in a way that is actually impossible for them to revisit if it was a spontaneous conversation. It's like as soon as you say this conversation out loud, it's gone. Whereas this is something that can be uh, mulled over, rewatched, played back fast or slow. And um, it's also something you can share with absent students, not that it can really make up for the fact that they were absent from the lesson, but it is something that can be shared with students who aren't physically present. And it's also something that it's, it's a resource that stays there for the teacher next year as well. Um, Cause while having a conversation in the class is really valuable, it, every time that you have that conversation, it takes the same amount of energy to perform. Whereas this only took energy once to make, and it's always there. It's becoming a larger library of resources that you as the teacher can pull from. So um, I'll draw back to the end of my talk. As a teacher, I ex I'm extremely grateful for the content that has been produced. And um, a lot of the content that I have made has been so that I can use it in classrooms or so that my colleagues can use it in classrooms. And um, I am extremely excited about what possibilities could exist, but also there's this urgent hunger that I have for more, really would like to have more content, more especially at the novice level 
content. And um, part of the reason why novice level content is so important is because uh, those people who are in novice classrooms, the students are the weakest and need the most support, but also the teacher in the novice classroom is most likely to be maybe not the most senior teacher in the school. Um, they usually put the senior teachers on the senior classes and there can be some problems with recruiting for the lower level classes, uh, sometimes resulting in the person teaching middle school Latin doesn't even know Latin kind of thing. So uh, novice level Latin is the area that needs the most support, uh, all the support we can give them, in my opinion. Uh, so my call is, wouldn't it be great if we had more novice level short form videos with lots of visuals that are exciting and nice for kids to watch? And uh, we can use it in online, we can use it in, in person. It supports the transition to uh, away from grammar translation, more towards communication and more towards treating the language as a language. Ways we can do that are we can be producing some ourselves like if you're a teacher and there's something that you always circle back to and make each year for for the students you perform it each year can you video that um, a lot of the stuff that I make is something that I've already been doing in class and now here's a video version of that also if you're an advanced Latin speaker and you'd like to have just some fun and some try at making something I would absolutely really welcome more content creators in this space because there's only really like one of me there's only one Irene Regini there's only one <laughs> Scorpio Martianus Lugranieri it's like wouldn't it be awesome if there were more content creators in this space? And the second thing is let's support content creators, old and new ones. Um, let's be uh, doing it in practical ways. If it's financially wise and responsible for you, then uh, things like supporting creators on Patreon goes a long way to showing how much you value their time. And also uh, if that's not your thing, liking, sharing, subscribing, all of that, and commenting. Sometimes the, the best pick me up at the end of the day is just seeing some of the YouTube comments that have been actually really encouraging on the stuff that I make. And I'm sure other content creators feel a similar way. So um, lots of love to content creators because you guys are alleviating, this is the content here, uh, you guys are alleviating a huge amount of pressure that is on teachers' shoulders when they switch to communicative methods, um, they don't have to be the only source of input in the classroom. Uh, all these other things, novellas, uh, YouTube, other kinds of resources are a massive help when we can all work together in providing compelling, comprehensible input for our students. And that's the end of my talk. Now, I do have problems with split focus, so I haven't actually been reading the comment section. So now I can actually read the comment section. Um, oh, yeah, making low pressure opportunities to speak like recording for fun is absolutely really helpful. I, I've found it very helpful for increasing my confidence in speaking Latin. And uh, there was a relatable drawing. <laughs> Uh, using existing content, you can focus on producing new content. Yes, exactly. So everything just makes a whole lot easier to, to, to do your job as a teacher. Uh, what do I feel about the available novellas? A lot of them look like beginners writing for beginners. It's usually so bad that I cannot recommend them to students in good faith. I have been thinking about the novellas for a long time and I have some rather controversial opinions. I guess it's impossible to have a controversial, to have a not controversial opinion when the community is so divided on this. Uh, but I have been trying to get my thoughts into a, uh, into a less messy zone about it because I think that on one level, novellas are authentic in the sense that you can read them fluently and get large amounts and who doesn't want large amounts of compelling content for their students 
The other hand, however, is that there is a bit of a quality control issue or more like um, there are certain things that feel like problems to more advanced speakers because they're more aware of the, the way the language sounds and which do not feel like problems to a lot of language teachers. And how much of an issue is that? Uh, that's something I've been kind of grappling with recently. And honestly, I, I would love to see the uh, overall quality of novellas to improve, and I'd love to be part of supporting that. Um, but at the moment, it is a little bit of a Wild West situation with novellas, uh, and yet they can still be useful for students. Really depends on your your priorities and situations. Um, should I get uh, Seamus to you should, say? You should. <laughs> Otherwise, we're yes. going into a novella discussion for the next half an hour. Uh, so my question is, um, I think a lot of people see videos and say, I can't do that. They're like, oh, maybe I could do the Latin. But the, 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 the barrier, what do you see is the barriers to entry in terms of content creation, particularly around videos and saying, oh, that seems like a lot more work. And particularly if you haven't done that kind of thing, you're like, oh, I can get into my classroom and teach. But to go away and make a video, particularly with a good visual content, seems like mm. a lot of extra learning, or like an extra learning curve. Yeah, I guess um, probably one of the barriers to entry is having a good video editing software so that you can not have to do everything in one take kind of thing. Uh, ask if you're part of a school, for example, if you're a teacher at a school, ask your school for their software, because oftentimes they can be quite happy to share their subscription to Adobe Premiere Pro. And you can have this really nice uh, editing experience on your school provided device or whatever and um yeah just absolutely use your use your employer for that uh and the other thing is think about smart ways you can use visuals that aren't going to be graphic intensive like uh, you don't have to be really good at drawing but maybe you could be holding up props the props that you use in your classroom like what visuals do you use in your classroom make them into a video kind of thing. I actually do a lot of drawing for my classroom, so I make a lot of drawings into my videos, but I don't like animate. I just have the same slideshows that I have in class, and uh, that helps keep the logistics under control. Uh, I'll just quickly skim that, um, skim the comment section again. It might help if there were more non-fiction CI readings. Yes, exactly. Uh, having a fictional voice alongside actual Latin is quite hard. Uh, writing is hard. Uh, have you worked with TikTok? I have not worked with TikTok. I don't understand Gen Z TikTok, honestly. Uh, one thing I love about videos is they are accessible in places where shipping and novellas and books is, ex is expensive. Yes, exactly. It is amazing that the YouTube video model can make some compensation for content producers while creating a free product for everyone to use, which is awesome. I, I love it when I can get stuff for free. Lots of second language learners learn a lot of their language from interacting with other second language learners. Again, in an ideal world, yes, the quality control of the novellas would be higher, but that can only happen with money. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that um, there are ways that we can grow in this space. And um, it's not like being exposed to some bad examples of Latin language is going to ruin you. You'll not get ruined by anything. Uh, public libraries often have both hardware and software to borrow. Oh, nice pro tip on how to get software. DaVinci Resolve is pretty good and free for editing. Yes, uh, I've been looking into that um, as a possible thing myself. Do you know of anyone making training materials or do you yourself have any plans to make training materials that would help teachers transition away from GT. I do know of training materials. It's the um, the YouTube channel, Latin Teacher Lab. Like that was an amazing resource for me to uh, use early in that transition. Just go Google Latin Teacher Lab. It has Justin Slocum Bailey talking about practical ways of doing it, even if you're not a fluent Latin speaker. And the other resource I highly recommend is Common Ground by Florentia Henshaw. That book has been a real game changer for me. And um, it kind of, it's it's from not a Latin teacher perspective, which is quite valuable. Uh, and it's, it's a different take. Like the way that um, 
Latin teachers are doing CI. It's slightly different from the way that uh, Florentia Henshaw is showing meaning focused for meaning connections, uh, teaching through uh, reading for things like main ideas and things like that. Like, I think that that's a really healthy perspective that we should be taking on board in our teaching. Uh, now, the other thing is the number of teachers using CI is relatively small, but I do think there are more who want to use it, just don't know where to start. And yeah, exactly. So having those models from YouTube videos from Justin Slocum Bailey and from the Common Ground book is really important. Uh, Latin Teacher Lab, yeah, very good. Any other questions? I have made several public presentations on the topic of how to get started transitioning, says Gregory, which are also available on YouTube. Yes, go and check out Gregory's YouTube. I think I would like I found that difficult too. Like I think everyone who who converts finds it difficult, particularly because you just do not know what you're doing. And I was not trained as a teacher. Um, and so one of my pieces of advice to people is go and learn go and go and learn by a ci method another language and just just have that experience for a while not that you'll necessarily teach the way you're then taught xyz language but but having that experience as a student is invaluable for figuring out how to do it as a teacher yeah absolutely and sage you have your uh, hand up yeah, sure. I mean, I feel like we've heard a lot about the challenges and the struggles with uh, transitioning from grammar translation, but what I, I guess it's a question for you, but also to the other teachers here. Um, what are some of the great aspects that have come from diversifying your approach to teaching language? And I would, you know, I would ask, like, how has this diversified approach created a more inclusive environment um, for individuals who would previously been excluded from the discipline because as we know classics is a pretty exclusive discipline to study so just like what are some of the positive aspects you've really found because I think amidst all of the this is a hard thing to do I, it's nice to hear this, a lot of the positives that have come with it as well yeah absolutely we've got to we've got to celebrate the wins along the way because um what one of the immense privileges of being an in-person teacher is seeing the students in person and seeing the the difference it makes to the joy and the engagement that you get from students in person. Um, going from do this, write out this table and complete this exercise to let's focus on the meaning, let's focus on the story, let's interact. That has been an immensely more joyful experience for students in the classroom. And I can see it in the way that some of the students who I know wouldn't do well on a traditional test have been the most vocal and supportive and um, engaged students in spoken interaction or other types of uh, out loud um, real language use. And that's been incredibly encouraging. It's like, this is a language. It's not meant to be a, a proxy IQ test. Uh, let's treat it as a language and not as a, are you smart enough to be in my class kind of thing. And I've also seen students improve in some of the traditional metrics. Like I continue to offer translation as a, um, as a assessment task. And I've found that slowing things down to be at the pace that students can handle and focusing on comprehension and meaning has massively improved the scores of my year nines in translation. And when I've done that also to my year tens, it has improved them in their overall confidence and proficiency in the language. So yeah, I've, I've seen some tangible results as well as just the emotional of um, engagement in the classroom. Okay, let me see some other things in the chat. Ah, nice. Miletus has uh, getting to speak Latin every day, all day is great. And working with students who aren't in classics because they stick with it, uh, it's great. Um, 
not being like not being the reason my students are stressed yeah exactly students get stressed by so many other things and um my year 12s have said to me in term three they felt like they just were constantly slapped by um school work but not in latin class <laughs> they were totally fine in latin uh it also allows a greater variety of activities yes variety of activities are good using a hybrid method with a textbook um i'd say look hybrid is a different kind of mindset to convention based kind of thing like you can absolutely use a textbook and adapt it to be comprehension based um and i think especially if you change the way that you assess to be about proficiency rather than rather than about mastery of elements isolated elements of the language you can keep using some of your textbook materials as input and um, teach in a comprehensible input based way uh, so unfortunately that does take a lot of work though <laughs> a lot of adaptation a lot of making stories more comprehensible and making extra stories in in between uh, I've done that with the Oxford Latin course basically the Oxford Latin course has got some real problems with it but I've been shining this turd very for a very long time uh, and Let's see, at uni, I set a lot of videos and online talk um, to go through the required text as a kind of hybrid approach. I think what's really important is that you're transformative of your materials. Like um, you can't just read aloud from the textbook and it's now a um, comprehensible thing just from the format of it. I think it's really important to think about supporting vocab and supporting meaning uh, comprehension through visuals or other means. Uh, or through getting students to use top-down strategies of reading, like getting them to predict what the text is about to say and then confirm or deny their um, predictions. Going back to the online space as a Wild West, would we want to encourage any content, even incorrect or imperfectly fluent content? Is there a good way to having less but better content? Is it, is it good to have less but better content? That's a that's a thing but we do need a transition i'll have to think about that is it better to have volumes of um of uh, lower quality i don't know I, I don't know so um yeah uh we probably should transition to the next talk <laughs>